pull your slides up. So Anya Osachuk is um, a, the, the Western New York Small Fruit Specialist with Harvest New York, which is a part of Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, she is an expert in uh, small fruit and berries, and she'll be sharing her berry expertise with us today by talking about how we can deal with spotted wing drosophila in our home berry plants. So go ahead, Anya. Thank you so much, Amara. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the spotted wing drosophila, which is an invasive fruit fly that made its way from Asia about 10, now I'm getting close to 15 years ago. Um, it it affects blueberries, raspberries, cherries, and strawberries. Cherries are actually beyond my jurisdiction, so I won't be talking too much about cherries today. Um, but here's a picture of the spotted wing drosophila. Uh, so it's this is blown up quite a bit. The real spotted wing drosophila is, you know, the the size of those kinds of fruit flies that hang out on your bananas, um, and they they're different from a lot of the other kinds of fruit flies. That do hang out in your bananas and in rotting fruit because they actually have this really crazy uh, egg laying organ called an ovipositor and that organ is serrated and that actually lets it sort of drill into berries that are uh, really not don't have the broken skin and so they can ruin perfectly good fruit by laying eggs in them and then the eggs hatch they turn into larvae and the larvae are gross which is why we care about this pest um, so let's see. So really quickly, this presentation will first go over sort of the biology and the behavior of the spotted wing drosophila and the sorts of crops that it affects. We'll look at chemical control tools, <laughs> excuse me, and I won't spend too much time talking about that because I'm guessing as homeowners, you're probably not going to be spraying too much, um, if at all, on your berry plantings. Um, and then we'll talk about some ways that you can sort of keep track of the spotted wing drosophila in your property, should you want to. Um, and we'll talk about sort of ways that we can control the spotted wing drosophila that don't involve spraying pesticides on them. Um, and then we'll sort of conclude with a little summary of all this information. So it's a lot of slides and uh, I bear with me because it may be a lot of information, but I hope it's interesting. So the first thing that I want to point out is that this fruit fly is found throughout the United States, um, but we're going to be really focusing on this chart here on the lower left. Uh, so you can see it's a chart that compares the abundance of spotted wing drosophila by the month of the year. So you see that populations sort of start picking up around May and June. They really peak during July, August, September, and into the fall. And then when the winters get cold around, you know, December, sometimes in November, the populations crash. So what happens? Um, the reason is because the spotted wing drosophila doesn't really like the cold temperatures. It, like many bugs, they really like that warm weather. Um, and there are some spotted wing drosophilas that do actually overwinter in this climate, uh, but we think that the majority of spotted wing drosophila actually sort of fly up north from the south, and then some other ones overwinter and get through the cold, uh, as depending on how cold the winter is. Um, so the infestation risk is really related to the severity of winter that is super true. This winter, we had a relatively mild winter across most parts of the state with a couple really cold days. So that didn't kill off a lot of the overwintering spotted wing drosophila. Um, but then we had that day on May 18th where across the state, we had a lot of freezes and frosts. And we think that that sort of knocked back the spotted wing drosophila population a little bit because a lot of them froze to death that day. Um, but now, you know, it's hot, it's humid. Uh, spotted wing drosophila love both of those things. They don't like the dry weather too much, but we're having, you know, really high humidity, high heat. So we're expecting the populations right now to be really getting really high and they're going to be hungry and they're going to be going for the berries. Um, so we sort of wanted to figure out, it's an invasive pest, uh, but we wanted to figure out um, if the spotted wing drosophila actually is the same in the US as it was when it came over from uh, Asia. And so 
I, I wasn't involved in this research, but this was a multi-university partnership and they collected spotted and Drosophila from across the country. And they found that actually, these are some charts of like genetic variation between groups of spotted winged Drosophila. And they found that there's actually quite a bit of genetic uh, variation between the spotted winged Drosophila in the US and in Asia. So they're kind of, they, they're already mutating a little bit based on their time here in the US. Um, and we care about this because uh, a lot of commercial folks will spray insecticides to prevent spotted wing drosophila from ruining their fruits. And we want to make sure that if folks do spray, that those sprays work, you know, as fast as possible and they don't leave resistant flies flying around. So we can just take a quick look at seasonality. So you'll see that if you have a little strawberry patch in your home, probably if it's a June bearing strawberry patch, you know, the season is going to be over before spotted wing drosophila really takes off. This is a chart of North Carolina. So you see blueberry season is a little bit off compared to New York. Um, our blueberry season here actually starts more in like late, late July, mid, mid to late July into August, especially this year, our blueberry season is a little bit late. Um, so spotted wing drosophila in New York will get a lot of the blueberries, even though in North Carolina, they don't get too many. And then blackberries and fall bearing raspberries also spotted wing drosophila really attack them a lot based on uh, just the time of year and that the fruit is ripe. So some strawberry varieties will actually produce fruit all summer long. And if you get fruit that are ripe sort of in July and in August, they will also have the spotted wing drosophila likely looking at them and possibly laying their eggs in them too. So we can see that managing spotted wing drosophila is pretty, it, it tends to work, you know, um, if we, if we spray insecticides, if we pick our berries as soon as they're ripe, or even a little bit before, if we can get away with it, uh, we're just going to have a lot less spotted wing drosophila in the berries. Whereas if we let the berries sort of hang out on the bushes and we don't really do anything to stop them from finding the berries and making it alive to them, you'll probably get berries um, that are infested with spotted wing drosophila if they're underripe, all the and like the most, of course, when they're ripe. Um, so that's that's kind of an unfortunate reality that probably if you don't do anything to control them, they might already be in your berries. Um, and, you know, just to reiterate that when there aren't too many spotted wing drosophila around, they tend, the few that are alive tend to only go for the perfect ripe berries. But when there's a whole bunch of spotted wing drosophila around, they'll start attacking green underripe berries, uh, as well as, you know, really going for the ripe ones too. Uh, so keeping the numbers down is going to help protect quality of like all of your berries. And we're finding some insecticide resistance, which is really alarming, especially in California. So California season is really wonderful for growing because you just have such a long summer. Um, but unfortunately for spotted wing drosophila, that's a long period of time that they love to be in and survive and lay eggs. Uh, so we are seeing just more sprays being put down in California in general and also more resistance popping up. So as homeowners, you may have access to spinosin-based products for your spotted wing drosophila. And, you know, that's that's one of the few really effective tools that is um, used for spotted wing drosophila. And unfortunately, we're finding resistance in that. So that's not very good. Um, we're also finding um, Mustang Max which is uh, the active ingredient of that is Zeta cypermethrin. So it's, um, I think it's a pyrethroid-based insecticide, a different active ingredient, and we're also seeing resistance to that. So basically that means that even folks who do spray insecticides for spotted wing drosophila, that those can eventually become less effective. And that's unfortunate because we don't have a whole big toolbox of sprays that we can use to control this pest. Um, so in the lab, folks monitor resistance using this sort of assay. Um, here's the picture of it being done. And um, for folks who are spraying insecticides on their home plantings, um, you know, the number one thing that I want for you to understand is that it's really important to rotate products, which means that if you spray 
uh, say, a spinosin-based product like um, Entrust on your berries one time, then the next time you shouldn't spray it again. You should spray something like um, Mustang Max or Pygenic uh, or just another, a product that has a different active ingredient. Um, and we also want to put the, the most high toxicity products really early in the program, which is kind of strange sounding, but when you have the low populations already, we find that like super duper poisoning those flies <laughs> tends to work the best. Um, you also want to really keep the pesticide on the crops that are being treated. So, you know, don't spray areas that are not the, the crop that you're treating. Um, and also, yeah, just keep track of your berries, you know, check if the sprays actually worked. And if it didn't, let your extension office know because, uh, you know, there might be a resistant population popping up and we'd want to know about that as soon as we can. Um, another problem, so I visit a lot of commercial berry farms uh, for my work, and I do see that the farms that spray the most uh, insecticides tend to also have just really weird blowups of bugs on their property. So here are some examples. Um, the reason for that is that basically these, there's a lot of uh, healthy, you know, beneficial insects that can also get killed by the sprays that folks use to control the spotted wing drosophila. Um, so you tend to have overgrowth of scale insects, which is this picture on the left here, um, and mites and aphids, uh, which are not pictured. I think that picture of the blueberry leaf is another sort of scale insect too. Um, let's see. So what we can do to check if our sprays work is we can actually use lures. Um, and this is a little chart just showing that the sugar and yeast lure is the most effective, which is great because that's really cheap. You just mix some sugar water with a little bit of baker's yeast um, and you put it in a cup. You'll see an example of that shortly, but that can be a really nice way of just keeping track of how many flies there are in your planting. And we do something similar uh, on commercial farms too. So here's a picture of that trap I was talking about. I'm going to blow up my screen for a second so you can see it. So you see, this is a really simple, really cheap design. All you need really is a peanut butter jar. And you just drill some holes, you put in your solution. It can be sugar and yeast, uh, or you can get really fancy and buy these spotted winter soft little lures. Um, and you hang them up in the bush and they taste they smell just as yummy to the spotted drosophila as the fruits do. So you'll get about 50-50 like likelihood of spotted wing drosophila going into the cup or going into your berries. So it's a good way to keep track of the flies, but you can't control the flies using this. Another option that some folks use is they use this sticky trap. Um, those can be nice too, uh, although your hair tends to get caught on them. And this can be a really nice way to sort of really just look at the bugs on your planting and keep track of what what's out there should you start spraying. All right. And so some really cool work that's being done in the US, uh, in New York actually, is just looking at these tiny little parasitoid wasps. So these wasps are attacking spotted wing drosophila, uh, well, not spotted wing, but drosophila pupa. Um, and they're like smaller than a millimeter. I think they're super duper tiny. Um, but the problem is that the parasitoids in the United States don't attack spotted wing drosophila because the spotted wing drosophila isn't native to here, so they wouldn't have developed an appetite. Um, but there is work releasing a, a parasitoid from uh, Japan, Gnapsis brasiliensis, uh, that does attack the spotted wing drosophila. And we're hoping that that'll sort of create a native population, a naturalized population of predators that'll slowly, you know, just decrease the pool of spotted wing drosophila in our ecosystem. So the process to actually let us release a bug for this purpose is very long and very rigorous. Um, and here's just an overview of the process, but you can see that we uh, have already started releasing the pests in 2022. Now it's 2023 and the research group is actually just checking if these Gnapsis brasiliensis predatory wasps survived the winters here. Uh, so exciting stuff. And um, for homeowners who don't wanna spray, uh, so far, what we recommend is you can use um, exclusion netting. Um, you can have irrigations that are sort of more conducive to uh, not letting spotted on your softla and, you know, enjoy the humidity. 
uh, you can use a weed mat um, for your berry plants. Although, honestly, I wouldn't recommend that for blueberries. That would be a really good option for strawberries. Um, and you also just, you know, really simple stuff. Harvest your berries as often as you can and refrigerate your berries as soon as they're harvested. And that's really going to slow down the spotted winged Drosophila the most. But if you can't afford to do an exclusion netting, I'd say that's one of the most effective ways to control for spotted winged Drosophila. So here's a picture. We've had some trials in New York. Um, it's basically, you, the important thing is you need a really fine mesh, like less than one millimeter, and usually have this uh, metallic structure that you drape the netting over. And because of snow in the winter, you want to take the netting down once the season is over too. So this, it's an expensive solution to install, but it works really well for blueberries and also for raspberries. You leave the netting off until pollination is over. You put it on once the pollination is done. It's really effective. Um, irrigation, again, the spotted winged Drosophila really like humid conditions. So if you have a drip line or just water your bushes really low to the ground, that's going to keep the spotted winged Drosophila dry so they won't enjoy hanging out in your berries so much. Um, mulching, you can also use a weed mat to basically suppress weeds and that'll keep the humidity down because you're not gonna have weeds growing um, right at the base of your plants. But I think weed mat is problematic for other reasons. So frankly, I would not recommend this approach for berries. Um, pruning, you know, airflow is really important. So the more you prune your bushes, especially cane berries like raspberries and blackberries, uh, the more airflow you'll have and the less humidity. So I see I only have two minutes. Um, so I'll just finish up saying pick your berries as soon as they're ripe. That's really important. Um, and if you do find spotted winter softly in your berries, just, you know, here's a really extreme way. Just destroy the cold fruit, heat it in the sun for a couple of days and bury it really deep. Um, just don't let the berries fall down on the ground because the flies are going to come out and you're going to have a bigger population in your home. Um, and refrigeration works really well too. Freezing works even better. Um, and for farms, especially the post-harvest storage makes a lot of sense. I'm going to uh, fly through and I'll just finish with these management recommendations. Um, you you want to use traps to monitor the spotted wing Drosophila just to figure out when they're there or talk to your local extension agent. Uh, they can help you figure out if populations are found in your property or not in your property, in your county, in your region. Um, you can sample fruit by floating them in salt water to check if you have the larva in the fruit. Uh, we'll share a link for how to do that in the chat. Um, you, If you spray, you know you do want to start spraying once you find the spotted wing Drosophila in your fruit using the salt floats. Um, you want to rotate insecticides if you do choose to spray or just have a setup that sort of keeps your bushes clean and not too humid. Um, and yeah, keep your fruit refrigerated or frozen as soon as you pick them. All right. So thanks for bearing with me. That was a lot of information. Do we have time for questions tomorrow? Um, oh, um, Japanese schools. Go ahead. Yeah, go we, ahead. Could, we could take one question if you want to if you want to tackle that, or if that's, if there's a resource you can direct folks to for Japanese beetles, um, feel free. Great. Thank you. Yes. Um, I I'll say with Japanese beetles, actually physically removing them is probably the best. Um, I know some folks, a dad and a, a dad and his son on a commercial farm, they'd walk down their raspberry planting in the evenings with a big bed sheet. And one person would sort of knock the Japanese beetles into the bed sheet and the other person would just kind of catch them, or you could use a trash bag or, um, you know, even a vacuum cleaner, like those sorts of things, just physically getting the beetles out with the aid of technology tends to really work the best. Don't get the Japanese beetle pheromone traps because those tend to attract the beetles in more than they actually kill the beetles on your property. Amara is wise. She then composts the Japanese beetles after freezing them. I bet they make really good compost. Okay, folks, I'll share the link for the salt floats in the chat, but thank you so much. And I'll let uh, Linda take it away. Thank you so much, Anya. Um, and Linda, if you want to pull up your slides while I uh, introduce you. So um, Dr. Linda Rayer is a senior lecturer and senior research associate in the Cornell Department of Entomology. And we have invited Linda to speak today because she is a spider expert. 
Um, so today she's going to be talking about spiders in your home, why they're in your home and what you should do about them. And perhaps just as importantly, what you should not do about spiders in your home. I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying oh, to. No worries. Ah, thank you. You've all been there. Looks perfect. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, so, hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Linda Rayer. I'm at Cornell University in the um, entomology department, and I'm currently the president of the American Arachnological Society. So, oh, please. Okay, so why are there spiders in your home? And the answer is pretty simple, because they can get in and find prey. And uh, spiders get into your home many, many different ways. Uh, it can be a crack in the foundation. They come in through little cracks in the window or the screen. Um, human habitations are just great for certain kinds of spiders, especially, who like the eaves to build their webs on or who like the underside of tables to build their webs on. Uh, my shower turns out to be just an awesome place for a bunch of animals. So basically spiders are there because they can get in and they stay there either because they can't find their way out or more likely because they can find food. So the best way to get rid of spiders in your home is unequivocally a deli cup or some equivalent. Use a deli cup, slip either paper or the top of the deli cup um, on the underside, take them outside and dump them there. That's the best way. It's, as far as I'm concerned, the only way to get rid of them. <laughs> so I wanted to just give a couple of, of fine points about spiders. So basically, spiders are your friends. Spiders are really quite good. They're all predators on primarily insects. They're hugely ecologically important because they eat pest insects. Very, very important in gardens, um, probably less important in human homes, but the point is, is that they're primarily uh, beneficial natural enemies. They're very, very diverse and I'd like to give you a quick introduction to some of the animals that I find, at least in, in our home. Very few spiders are dangerous to humans, and here in upstate New York, here in New York, uh, relatively few. So, uh, probably the most common one that I see are the house spiders, uh, which is a relative of the um, uh, black widow, but completely harmless. And these guys build uh, messy cobwebs under tables and eaves. They lay egg sacs with lots of young. And the one thing that I don't like about them in the house is they tend to uh, be fairly messy uh, defecators. Everybody must have cellar spiders. These are extremely leggy, leggy spiders that are found near ceilings in, in slightly messy webs. Very leggy. These guys aren't dangerous at all. They predate on other spiders and are really cannot uh, harm people at all. About 10 years ago, this rumor started that I must get asked about all the time, are so-called daddy long legs the most poisonous spiders in the world? And this is completely a uh, urban myth. Um, cellar spiders are falsids, they're spiders. They've got kind of weak chelicera and weak venom. They couldn't even bite us if they tried. And they certainly wouldn't affect us, even if they could. The other thing that are sometimes called daddy long legs are harvestmen or opilionids, which aren't even spiders that don't even have venom. So the short answer is no, these guys are not dangerous. Neither one of them is dangerous. Um, uh, you will also commonly find in your house various jumping spiders. The bold jumper is very common here in New York, as well as this 
uh, pantropical uh, jumper, which you'll recognize as jumping spider by it, its heavy front legs. These guys have big eyes. The jumping spiders are awesome. Here at Cornell, I could start a jumping spider fan club if I was so inclined. These guys are essentially the primate of the spider world, really intelligent, visual. They'll watch you. These guys tend to live on windowsills and they overwinter in windowsills and mailboxes uh, very, very commonly. You'll find these primarily on walls. There are a number of big spiders that you'll find in your basement. And I just want to say, these guys aren't dangerous. They're big enough that I know a lot of people are creeped out about them, but I recommend getting them in your cup and taking them outside. Uh, the nursery web spiders are, these guys are, are big spiders and you'll find them on the wall hunting generally face down. And then there's big wolf spiders that you find on the ground. These guys are kind of clunky um, and have somewhat larger eyes. There is only one spider that I aggressively kill in my home. And these are yellow sack spiders. These are quite small spiders. They're the size of my little fingernail and they're yellow to tan, but um, they're little and are reputed to have a nasty bite and, and um, that uh, can cause some tissue damage. These guys tend to build at the junction between the ceiling and the walls, little tiny sacks because they're sack spiders. And they shouldn't be confused with other animals, but this is one I kill. There are two other spiders in New York, which are venomous, which are super, super rare, but with climate change, I'm hearing from uh, pest control folks that black widows are tending to come in from the South. Black, but both of these I consider to be very rare. Brown recluses tend to be brought in on uh, like shipping pallets rather than anything else. Um, recognize, uh, I don't know if everybody can see my pointer. Brown recluses are found on the ground. They're kind of leggy. They're real, they're called recluses because they're shy, but they have this very clear fiddle shape on their carapace and their six eyes. Black widows, if any of you watching this don't know what a black widow looks like, um, it's too late. But black widows really are black. They really do have the red uh, hourglass pattern on their belly. They hang upside down. They're cobwebs. And these are both animals that ought to be killed. And uh, I think that is it. So I'm happy to answer questions if there's any time. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I think we are out of time, and um, I think everything I'm seeing in the chat are appreciation for how adorable jumping spiders are. Um, I think <laughs> we can all agree that jumping spiders are pretty cute. Um, so thank you again, uh, Linda, for this great information on spiders, and Anya for this great information on spider wing Drosophila. Thank you all for attending today. Um, we will have recordings of um, this presentation uh, posted on YouTube, and I'm putting a link in the chat. Please do join us for our next event, which is August 4th. We are having an all wildlife event on August 4th, so we'll be talking about groundhogs and bat exclusion, and I know that that is information that I'm interested in hearing about, so I hope you all join us. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day.